Hi, everybody. This is another episode of Conversations with Dr. Cybersecurity. And tonight I have a very, very special guest. He goes by the hashtag Hype Man. And once you meet him, you will see why. So, Ken, please come in, introduce yourself for a couple of minutes. And then let's go into your questions and topics. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, first off, thanks, Dr. Jaseep, for the invite and having me on uh, the show. Appreciate it. Um, so my name is Ken Underhill. For those that don't know me, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, I teach security-related topics to a lot of people, uh, mostly around hacking and forensics. Um, I got my start in IT many, many years ago, uh, back in the dot-com era, worked as a network engineer for a while. Um, got sick of that, decided to go into healthcare. I shared that earlier uh, before this. I shared the reason why, but I won't share it now. <laughs> but uh, went into healthcare for a while, uh, both as a medic and nurse in the military. Uh, got out of that, worked as a nurse civilian side for pediatrics for a while, and then got tired of that again, you know, as many people do. And I went back into IT, moved into cyber um, in the roles I was in, just kind of a natural flow into that. And then I was also doing things like pen testing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, little, uh, that little clause, they always put all other duties as assigned. Uh, <laughs> they, they thoroughly abused that. So I was doing a lot of different things. So that's, that's kind of my intro. Uh, and then I, I also own my own company as well, a tech company um, where I do a couple of different things, but nothing, nothing really, a, well, a little bit around cyber, but not really around cyber. So we'll just say it like that. Well, that's great. That's a wonderful introduction. As, you, as we can see, a cybersecurity professional is actually a lot of things. It's a very interdisciplinary di uh, discipline. So, so Ken, what, what, what kinds of questions and topics would you like us to talk about today? Sure. Well, I think the number one question from my followers on LinkedIn is going to be, are you a cat lover or a dog lover? <laughs> actually, when I was growing up, I used to like, love cats. Th those were the only things that were allowed. I guess they were smaller and I was less afraid of them. But as I grew older, I understood how dogs can be a great companion because cats don't go out walking with you, but dogs do. So I would say I am now equally fond of both, except, except when the dog is unfriendly and they're barking or aggressive that that, that 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 i find very scary <laughs> excellent great question <laughs> so so I'll, I'll ask like a real question now there's a lot of debate in the industry and i know there's a lot of debate because i did a post uh, a long time ago and it hit over like a hundred thousand views and people sent me uh -huh. hate mail and everything so with that being said um i and by the way i don't care about hate mail send it all you want <laughs> so are, do you, in your opinion are there actual entry level cybersecurity type jobs where you wouldn't need any IT or anything background? And if so, can you name some of those jobs just for the people out there that might be listening saying, well, how do I even get in? You know, I want to get in the industry, but how can I do so? So it's kind of a two-part question, right? So question number one, are there actual entry-level jobs? And then what are some of those ones, if they exist, that you've seen that people can kind of start going out and looking for? Excellent question, Ken. If there are entry-level jobs in any field, well, to me, that's a cybersecurity job today. There is no job that doesn't use technology or information. So let us say that you are a journalist and you like to write. Well, writing about cybersecurity topics is also a cybersecurity job, in my opinion, because to me, everything is cybersecurity. It's the modern business world. Let us say that you're going to do the help desk. So what, what, what one of my students here today Ali is doing well that is also cybersecurity helping somebody solve their problems answering questions blogging about it that's a job i think rare one of the guests today she's a blogger about this field so she's sharing her knowledge well that's also cybersecurity the fact that you are coming here you're educating people you're connecting people well, that connection is also cybersecurity. Going to a conference and even writing about that conference and sharing that knowledge with others is also a job that is related to cybersecurity. So the question is, what is it that you want to do? And what, where, where are your skills? Where is your passion? What about singing? God, you could write 
So we know that people are writing raps about cybersecurity today, right? So if you think about it, I, and I had told this to one of my students, in, in the uh, early students, and I said that today everything is cybersecurity. It is the modern business. So when we prepare a person to work in this modern world, we're basically building the executives of the modern world. That's what a true, that's what a cybersecurity professional is. So you look at me, I'm, I'm not tinkering with hardware, software and all that. Can I? Yes, that's an aspect of it. Network engineering. Well, to me, that's also aspect of cybersecurity. If you talk about teaching, that's also cybersecurity. So all depends on what it is that you want to do. So all jobs are possible. That is why I like to talk to people and give them that idea that if they want to be in this field, they can. We just need to find out what is their passion about and where, where is it that they want to make their mark. All right, then what was the second half of your question, Ken? Well, well you actually kind of answered that, right? Because you mentioned different jobs that somebody could do, right? A writer, blogger, singer, every, you know, so you kind of actually answered that second part of the question already. Oh, okay. All right. So I have another one for you. Don't worry. <laughs> I have no problem. <laughs> So from your experience, because you've, you've done a lot of different things, right? Now you're, you're working for academia. Um, you've done that for a number of years, but you also worked in healthcare as a CISO and stuff. So from your experience as a hiring manager, and we'll kind of use that term a little loosely, Very from nice. your experience, are there certain qualities that you've noticed in people that you were able to identify, like if this person has these qualities they're going to be a very successful like practitioner or leader or something. So are, so are those quality, are there certain qualities you've noticed? And if so, how do the people out there listening actually showcase those to the audience or the industry or whomever to actually get those conversations going to get those jobs? Another excellent question. So I, I'll, I'll share a little story with you about one of my hiring experiences. I value integrity very much because in this field, if you give people false information, what's going to happen? They're going to make false decisions, wrong decisions. So, so I always valued the integrity very much. So I was interviewing somebody and I asked the person, okay, so you're interviewing with us. Who's your first preference? She said, we were, she had said some other university. I said, who's your second preference? Some other university. We were her third preference. So I said, okay, now let me find out why. So she explained why. After all that, the rest of the committee members don't wanna, didn't want to hire her. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Of all the people, this was the one person who gave us 100% correct answers, and the answers were so solid and so bold. I mean, she basically told us the truth without flinching. No exaggeration in her resume and stuff like that. No, none of that nonsense. So I could trust this person. Then I realized why she wanted the other two things. So what I did was I actually tailored the job so that she could experience all the areas that she wanted to experience in the other two universities and basically told her a proposal that she could not refuse. Because I, as a hiring manager, cannot just look for my own benefits. If I need to retain an employee, I have to make that employee happy also and fulfill their needs because it's a two-way street. So what I did was I basically told her when I was offering her the job, I basically said, you wanted to go to that university for that reason and that university for this reason, but what if we give you all three of those things here and you will be able to try all those things out, but my jo primary job is this and this is what you'll have to do, how do you feel? Well, guess what? Not only did she take the job, she had no experience because I, no, I could mentor. The things that I'm looking for are things that parents and society have already given them. The ethics, the integrity, the discipline. Because I want, I'm looking for somebody who can learn continuously, accept the mentorship, because I cannot teach somebody if they're not willing to receive. And it's much easier for me to teach somebody something who knows nothing but they have that eagerness and they, 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 they want to drive because our field is changing continuously. The tools we're going to use today, are we're not going to use maybe a year, two years later, right? So I don't care about tools. I don't care what tool they know, but I need to know 
are they going to learn? Are they going to be ethical? Am I going to have to worry about when they're doing work and when they're playing? These are things that always matter to me. So I am always looking for those kinds of qualities and the questions that I do are around those. I also look for writing capability. I also look for speaking capability. So if the person comes out very lucid and they're able to explain things very nicely, to me, that is wonderful. I'm also looking for friendly people because I always feel like I'm in the customer service business. So all my customers have to feel like they're taken care of. And if I don't have a friendly person, a smiling person, then my people are not going to be happy. I do that same thing right now, even when I'm hiring for faculty members. I could care less how much, how good they are at whatever, but if they cannot really take care of the students and really really take care of the students, then they ha I have no use for them. Um, so I think just maybe one more question from me. There's, there's actually a large number of people that mm -hmm. reach out to me via LinkedIn and other channels. And one of the challenges they've had is they're, they're going and getting a graduate degree in cybersecurity or getting some certifications. They don't have any experience, but they're working like a job, like let's just say a police officer, because I actually get several of those. Mm -hmm. So they're full-time as a police officer. They can't afford to like leave that job, right? Their family can't afford that. They also don't have a lot of time because they're working extra shifts and all this stuff, right? So what can they actually do in that type of scenario to move into a full-time role or to do something part-time that's reasonable? Like how can they actually get that experience when they're, you know, they've got all these other responsibilities in some totally, and not really totally different industry, but just their job role isn't necessarily hands-on at a computer all day long, right? So, so how can they actually get some of that experience? So for, if you're talking about a police person, somebody who is in the police force, one of the biggest fields that is now happening in law enforcement is, is solving cyber crime. So it is, it is better to figure out exactly what you want to do in this new field that you're trying to do. Is it leveraging your old field and then enhancing the digital forensic side of it for an accountant again it could be forensic accounting but if you want to completely give up what you are doing and start say fresh in something else and you want to be a SOC analyst well I can't see how you would do that without somehow figuring out a way to get a second job or part-time job or something else to maybe shadow somebody or find a mentor who's willing to give you some time and you might have to invest in some voluntary time also. I've actually done that. I'll give you an example. There has been situations where somebody came to me when I was a practicing CIO and the person said that, hey, would you mentor me? I said, well, I don't have a paying job for that, but I have situations where I could take an unpaid intern or something like that and we would give you actual assignments. We wouldn't make you be a gopher or anything. So if you're willing to do that, maybe come one, one day a week or something like that, maybe even four hours in a, in a week and come and do that. And so there are many CIOs and CISO types who would love to have somebody come in and volunteer in that mode. And that could be another great way to get in if you're completely changing things. So to give you an example, I, I mentored somebody who was a wiring person into a network engineer. Well, obviously they would never get a network engineering job without getting some hands-on practical experiences in that. So that, that is the way I would recommend approaching that scenario. Okay, excellent. So I guess the, the, the final question I would have is, um, if I were your password, what would I be? <laughs> you didn't start with that question. I love these questions. <laughs> Hashtag hype man. There you go. What a great question. This, that's why. That's why he's the hype man. Yeah. So I'll I'll ask one one last question. One last question. So, uh, do you think that people, we'll just say security professionals, do you think that they should learn? some non-technical skills, so things like copywriting, marketing, public speaking, do you think those are beneficial to them? Huge. So for one of, one of the biggest things for a cybersecurity professional today is writing contracts, right? 
writing contracts, interpreting contracts, knowing the law, knowing the policies, knowing what type of data is supposed to be protected in what way. This whole area of governance, risk, compliance, it's huge. And then let's say you're working in government contracting. Well, writing proposals, uh, write, writing all that uh, is, is incredibly important. So you could even get into proposal writing. So that, I mean, the number of opportunities in this field is just simply amazing. And there is just simply no end to it. So I would say that cybersecurity is one field that literally brings together all of the modern skills for any modern business professional. So I would say people don't realize it, but true cybersecurity professionals are, are, are really the professionals that the modern world needs. If they're just pure tech jocks, that's not a full cybersecurity professional. If they're only doing penetration testing, they are a penetration tester. They're not a cybersecurity professional. A cybersecurity professional is much more broad has a broad perspective, they have a solid understanding of people, policy, technology, they also know strategy, they know contracts, they know governance, they know mission, they know how to tailor the strategy of, the, of your digital strategy to the mission of the organization. Thank you very much, Ken. Sophia is on. So, so say hello and introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and then we will go into your questions and sounds good topics. thank you for having me first of all thank you for this wonderful welcome uh so my name is sophia filiomeni i'm from ottawa ontario canada and i graduated with a bachelor of commerce degree and pretty much right after graduation i started working for a company called accenture who i still work for today and when I initially joined the company, I joined as a consulting analyst. So that was a, just an entry level consulting role. And with consulting, everything's kind of on a project by project basis. So the first project that I happened to be assigned to was on a security operations team. And given this time, I had absolutely no background in security, really even no familiarity with it at all. Um, but I took it as an opportunity. I, I ran with it and just saw it as a chance for me to learn something new. Mm -hmm. And little did I know that I end up, I would end up really liking it. I'd like the field and the practice. Um, so then I ended up aligning myself to the cybersecurity practice with, within the company. And now it's been just under two years that I've been working uh, in security. And to date, my work has been primarily in data protection, as well as security and uh, risk and compliance. So that's a little bit about myself. That's a wonderful introduction. So uh, as we can see from Sophia's introduction, once again, a cybersecurity professional has all these dimensions. So yep. that's wonderful. Thank you very much and welcome from Canada. So as you can see, we are truly a <laughs> global conversation going on over here. So wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. So what topics or questions would you have an interest in talking about today? Yeah. So my first question is, um, since I've only been in security for just under two years, I still feel very new especially compared to people who have more of a technical background and those have done that have done cybersecurity in school. Um, so my first question is, what advice do you have for individuals like myself who are fairly new to the field and, and do want to make a positive impact? Right. So here's what I would recommend to you. Because you're new, it, it, it is important for you to not be driven by what was done in the past. You can carve the new path. And the opportunity is huge in the area of cybersecurity leadership. That is where things are needed. And you can already see that there are too many people that are confusing cybersecurity with security alone. Mm -hmm. In this modern world, there is no such thing called security. It's all about risk management and you talked a little bit about that because what is security? I don't know what security is. Mm -hmm. It was a 1991 concept. There were models that started in that time. And in my book, I have shared that progression of the knowledge from 1991 till today. The modern cybersecurity professional is dealing with risks. It's that I have these vulnerabilities or things, or I have these business risks, but what am I going to do 
that makes sense for me right now to achieve my mission. And that could be taking some calculated risks, making some investments so that I have the opportunity to make a profit and fulfill my mission. Mm -hmm. And that mission requires the use of technology, information, digital tools. It requires people, it requires policy, it requires all of those things. And it also requires perpetual innovation because if you stay static, then you're basically a sitting duck. So what I would recommend to you is continue exploring and conversing with professionals like you are doing by coming to this conversation. So uh, my hat's off to you for agreeing to come here and also starting this conversation because you will see that a lot of my work involves things that you might want to embrace. If you embrace that, guess what? You will be the first cybersecurity leaders. There's too many people right now that are not doing cybersecurity leadership. They may be doing security and they think they're doing security, but I have no idea what they're doing, to tell you honestly. Mm -hmm. right. A lot of people don't know what they're doing. Yeah. That's part of the reason we have the problems. Mm -hmm. And that is why I have always said that the right knowledge beats the wrong experience every day. Mm -hmm. So it's your job to gain the right knowledge, the current knowledge, explain to them the difference between the old world of security and what is the new world of cybersecurity, and they aren't the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is something that I've explained to even my students mm -hmm in my class and I'm so thrilled that they're beginning to get it. Mm -hmm. Because too many people were just focused on the technology part. Oh, learning how to configure a firewall. That's important. But you have to know why you would configure that file one way or why would you choose this firewall versus another firewall and all that. And these are all business decisions. These are not technology decisions. Yeah. Great. Or who to hire if you you can best buy the best technology, but if you don't have the people or you've outsourced your people, well, you may have outsourced your greatest intellectual assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually leads into my second question that I had because I've attended a few um, conferences and meetups and I found that we were having the same discussion around this idea that not everyone necessarily knows what a cybersecurity professional looks like. It, because as you mentioned, it can be so broad. People don't really know when you say, oh, I'm a, I work in cybersecurity. People kind of think that you're just kind of there with a computer and a hoodie oh. and have the whole look, right. but it's more to that. So my question is, how do we not only get more people interested in cybersecurity, but how do we educate them on what a career in cybersecurity could look like? Another excellent question. So again, leadership and knowledge sharing is so important. And that is why one of my previous guests and former student, Katia Dean, was so instrumental. So she was one of the early mentees who graduated and basically started spreading that knowledge. She has done more to spread my definition and models than many other students. And my recommendation is, see, I as a single voice can't do much. And that's another reason why I'm having these conversations, because I'm hoping that it will create this groundswell of knowledge sharing, and all of you will become leaders in your own in sharing what cybersecurity truly is. Because it isn't about hacking, as you know. That, that, that is just a total myth. And it isn't about technology either. There, there, is prob there are probably more non-technology cyber jobs than there are technology-related cyber jobs, yet you won't find them advertised. And that's mainly because companies still don't know who to hire, and some of, sometimes the right people aren't in the company. Sometimes it is that person who grew up in the technology organization that has somehow now become the chief information officer, and they, maybe they're still in that technical realm. But the modern CIO isn't a tech jock. A modern CIO is somebody who understands the business 
and can drive that business using digital strategy. And that modern CIO could be some of you. Because once you understand this, because when I was CIO, I never had a separate like division or anything that worried about security or hardening the system. It was all one organization. Everybody had to do it the right way. There was a standard way of doing things. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a big believer in having security bolted on. So you see all these development teams nowadays. They call them DevOps teams and all that. And they, 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 they run and do agile development. And then they develop something really fast. And then another team comes in and they're the SecOps team or whatever. And they come in and try to bolt on security on top of it. And guess what? Start breaking things and slowing down things and then there's a headbutting between the two organizations going on but that's not the way this this, this, this development is supposed to be done mm -hmm. yeah you all can make that change you all can make that culture different the culture that exists today in the software development world is totally crazy mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's what i would recommend you you mm -hmm. all are in that amazing space where you have that influence of your peers. So one of the things that I've learned is that peer networking and peer teaching works a whole lot better than say me trying to teach say people at your age or something. Because when that message comes from you, it will resonate much better. You will be much better role models for your peer group than I would ever be. And that is why we need you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And we need you to talk. We need you to write. We need you to be vocal about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? Um, let's see, I have my list of questions. Uh, so one thing that I did want to ask you and get your opinion on, uh, so we're in a very unique and interesting time with, with the coronavirus going on. Mm -hmm. How do you think cybersecurity is or will be impacted um, or change or shift as we move forward? Another excellent question. Another, another opportunity for every one of us, including you, everyone in this field who understand technology so one of the things about cybersecurity professionals are that they also know how to use technology properly mm -hmm. and they are able to explain the use of that technology to other people i'll give you a very good example there was this thing about even using zoom and even zoom had a kind of a reaction and they very quickly did some brute force things that were not so necessarily good for the users because one of the things about technology sometimes is that ease of use is very important in for the technology and then this the security or the hardening pieces of the technology should never still interfere with a smooth user experience so it is very important that at this time we who might know about technology and its proper usage use our voice and our platforms to share the correct knowledge okay so let us say that people are criticizing a technology incorrectly then it is our job to point out the alternative story about that maybe it has to be use related because actually there was a lot of people bashing zoom about this zoom bombing thing okay well if you share out the zoom meeting link publicly in a forum that is not vetted or anything is just out there on say you posted the link on LinkedIn or some public forum well you don't know who's coming in whereas if you at least practice some form of controls like I do is is it very secure not very secure but it's still some security for example I'm collecting email addresses for the people and then you go to Eventbrite and then you get the link or it's a it's a person who I know and I've scheduled in a calendar and therefore I give you the link. And I also told you that don't share the link and, 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 and that. So, so I think it is very important that in this opportunity time that we should be sharing the power of technology. How mm -hmm. is it that we have this thing going on yet in many cases work hasn't really stopped. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and the places where the work has stopped, shouldn't we be teaching those businesses to figure out some ways to continue operating? Because I would say, regardless of what kind of a company you are, you should still be able to operate in some way, in some scaled down manner. Mm -hmm. And so we have an obligation to teach people. Mm -hmm. Education is, is another great example. There were, there were universities that would poo poo online education. Whereas I have always felt that the online education is the future of education because the other model is simply not working. We're making education far too expensive and far too out of reach for ordinary people. People who don't have multi-million dollars worth of income every year. Mm -hmm. And education is so fundamentally important to every society, everybody, because education is the biggest equalizer of people that we cannot afford to restrict it to only rich people. So technology is a great way to make education accessible. There was, yet there were a lot of universities that wouldn't do online education or they would poo-poo it as poor. Education is education. The media does not matter. If you are a good teacher, it doesn't matter whether you're teaching face-to-face -face or online, I'm the same teacher. Mm -hmm. And some of my students will probably attest to that. I'm right now um, I, it, at Stevenson University. It's a, it's a very traditional kind of a university, face-to-face -face classes and stuff like that. And we, had a we have a great time. But right now we can't do that. But guess what we're doing? We're meeting synchronously at the same class time. My students are coming in. Initially, some of them are, were a little hesitant. But I'm seeing slowly they are beginning to get used to this medium. So it's a lot of it is, has to do with that mental shift. And I think we have a huge responsibility in helping them in the mental shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sophia. I think that we have finished 15 minutes and really had a great chat with you. Good luck in your career. I hope you come back again. Thank you again for, for visiting us from Canada. And I am now going to bring in Mitch Parker. So good, good evening, how you doing? Hi, Mitch. Introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and tell us who you are and where you are. So, my name is Mitch Parker. I'm the CISO at Indiana University Health. I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. However, four years ago, I got offered a job out here to move to Indiana, move myself and my family out here. When I got started in security, it was approximately 17 years ago. I was actually working on a defense contract working on maintaining a source code control system for a military base. And I was approached about, hey, now that you put the system up, how do we lock it down? And I asked questions, because I, I had always done security on the back end as an interest, but I never did it full time. I did it as a software developer and asked, oh, you know how to security systems? Well, this came out with these documents called STIGs, Security Technical Implementation Guides. And we understand you know how to actually do them. So here's a Windows XP machine. Here's the STIG, figure it out. Two days later, I had a machine configured to the STIG standards and three complaints into DISA about the STIG. And from there on, I ended up being, I've worked primarily in security since 2003. And Got my, actually, got, only got my first full-time job in security in 2008 when I took the job at Temple running their security program. So I've been doing this for about 12 years and in the CISO role, and I don't know how I survived without having a good leadership program, but that leads into the questions that I was going to bring in. See, so after I got my job at Temple, one of the things I did is I leveraged the tuition benefits to the best of my ability and got two master's degrees. Ah, okay. I have a master's in IT leadership, which is, and then after that, got an MBA from Temple University Fox School of Business. I taught for a couple of years at Temple, and still, while I still have an adjunct role, I have one at IPUI now, I don't do that full-time anymore because with two kids, not exactly something I can, I can do and still do a full-time CISO job, but 
Mm -hmm. Leads into my first question to you, which is, what are some of the best non-technical college courses that you would recommend for someone in addition to cybersecurity courses? Non-technical. Well, I think public speaking would be very important. Uh, and I think getting formal training and practice. So I don't know if you know about Toastmasters. That's something that I, I would recommend because one of the things that happens in Toastmasters is that you learn to speak in very, very concise language, and but you ha it has to be substantive. So most of our speeches are five to seven minutes. So you can't be long-winded. So guess what? If you talk about executive level conversations, that's, that's the kind of conversations. Some of our speeches are one to two minutes. And that is, that is one of the areas that I would recommend. And it doesn't have to be college courses. You can do a lot of that at very low cost. And it's practice if you want. You see, because the Toastmasters, I think annual membership is like $110 or something like that. It's, it's very inexpensive. I do that regularly, and that's why I say that that, was, that is one of the things that has kept me fluent in my speech. I would agree with you. My team, we actually have a little something called the 30-second rule that we talk about. You mm -hmm. can't explain what you're doing in 30 seconds or two sentences, then why are you doing it? Excellent. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and also as part of the moment talking, right? So one of the, one of the ways, for example, politicians excel is because they're able to fend off any question anytime and give a pretty substantive answer. And so we're actually taught that particular skill in Toastmasters also, where you're given a table topic that you have no clue about, and you can either talk about that topic, or you can deflect another topic, or you can just make up your own topic. So it's pretty amazing, and that is an art, and I'm learning a lot of that also. That's excellent to hear, excellent. And that was going to lead into also my second question that I had for you, which is, what are your thoughts on leadership development after hiring, particularly in our leadership role? One of the deficiencies that I've found with senior leadership is that the options given, they got a lot of options for new leaders, but what the higher up you get in an organization, the smaller and fewer the options become for somebody when they get into a senior leadership role. And I find that very salient because as someone who literally went from being a consultant to senior leadership, I found that a lot of options were not there for someone like myself who was in senior leadership in, your, in their early 30s. Mm. So if you're, if you're talking about yourself personally, unfortunately there won't be inside the organization your mentors and coaches would almost have to be outside the organization. So I, I see, I know you from that CISO and CIO networking things. I think that you and I both were involved in, weren't we? Isn't that where we met originally? I met you at an event in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, approximately uh, five years ago. Yeah. So I think that that peer, that kind of peer group and then hearing from each other would be the best approach because I don't know internally. Now internally, the thing that could happen is that if you can latch on to a mentor internally who could be your sponsor in a way that, that who would maybe create opportunities for you and things like that. So maybe whoever you're reporting to, if that person could be like a mentor and a sponsor and open opportunities for you, that could be an avenue. And, but then the team that you are in charge of, you can develop that team pretty much on your own using some of the skills that I used, tech, uh, the techniques that I use, which is that one of, the, one of the easiest things that I did was that I never had a meeting where I was the only person as chair of the meeting. So uh, what I used to have is, say I had a seven member team or a 15 member team, whatever the number of members in my team, we used to have rotating meeting chairs. So everybody would get a turn in becoming meeting chair. And then a different person would be like a scribe for the meeting. And that allowed everybody to learn how to set the agenda, or to run the meeting properly, and also know what was important in the team. 
Because to me, it was very important that every member of the team knows about all the projects and priorities of the team. So that is the best way to develop. So if you're already in organizations where maybe somebody else is in charge, maybe suggest it to them. Could we have rotating meeting chairs? Could we try this and see if they accept? If they accept, it's, you're, it's golden. You now have the opportunity. Excellent. So, excellent. So I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. Okay. My next question. So what are your thoughts on the current large amounts of emerging technologies that we have and 5G and the entire paradigm shift to the cloud? And how do you think that's going to impact cybersecurity? Well, it's going to impact strategy big time. And, and so I think this is the... This is the thing, this is one place where we are digital leaders. So I don't see ourselves as just security professionals or anything. I, I, I mean, the, the, the modern CISO is actually the modern digital strategist for the company. And so when you go to the cloud, it could be all kinds of things. For example, are you outsourcing even your application development? Or are you just outsourcing the platform? And if you're doing anything in the cloud, I'm not a big fan of having a single cloud because a single cloud could mean you're now too dependent on this one vendor. You could have vendor locks. And where is your disaster recovery? Your disaster recovery better be in another vendor's cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So I never did cloud with single cloud situations, nor, nor would I ever recommend doing things like that. So I think that the modern digital strategists who are knowledgeable about these things should be able to point out the business risks because it is not just about the technological decision to go to the cloud. It is a big business decision now. It is Another curveball for you. What do you think security conferences are going to look like after COVID-19? After COVID-19? <laughs> you tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. A lot of the conference was, would probably have to start doing s streaming as a component. They certainly have to think about that as a disaster recovery mechanism, right? So many of the conferences that didn't do that and had to cancel outright, I would say had a problem. I would also think that sponsorships and things like that could change quite a bit because a lot of the conferences, CISO conferences that I was doing turned out to be where vendors were sometimes paying to speak and things like that. And I'm paying, saying nobody goes to a conference to have vendors speak. Why don't the vendors sponsor a true speaker and they can still get their sponsorship, they can still get their slides, and they can still get their mention, but people who are coming to the conferences need to get education content. They can't be getting like vendor content about their product. So I think that is likely to change because in a webinar in electronic format, in this kind of a format, now content is even bigger king. I mean, right now marketing webinars will simply not fly at all. Of all the infosex, social media news, which one do you think is the best one to learn from and why do you think that? I don't think I'm a good person for that because I don't really belong to enough social media security communities per se because other than LinkedIn, I don't use many other things. I know Peerlist is probably a good community for cybersecurity professionals. I know that there are a lot of very strong cybersecurity professionals that are contributing there. And I used to contribute a lot over there also, but lately I haven't done as much. So I'm probably not the best person for that because I'm more of a generalist networking in social media. I do a lot for personal brand development, community development, maintaining contacts with my the, the community that might want to like use my work or invite me for speaking opportunities and things like that. So I'm not 
in too many of the actual CISO kinds of discussions. So hopefully that's not too bad of an answer, but that's that's what that's an honest answer. I'm not the best person for that. I understand. I see your con every reason I asked that is I see your content on LinkedIn all the time. Okay. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's you why you're you got a pretty big presence there. <laughs> yeah. Are. I'm 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 trying to make that one of my main platforms. It is global and it has led to a lot of global discussions and things like that. So it's been very so I was gonna say we have we have time for one more question. Yes, we do. Okay, so I got a final one, bonus one here. First and the last one is: You think an MBA is worth it? I believe in your case it would definitely be worth it because you already know the digital strategy, you already know the cybersecurity strategy. So you see, for somebody who doesn't know that part, if you just do the MBA, because MBA is teaching you the financial strategy, accounting, marketing, all of those subjects, but they won't teach you anything about digital strategy today. Because in my opinion, a lot of that content is still stuck in the 1970s. But those of you who already have that background, you go get an MBA, you're ready to be the modern CEO of the modern organization. And that's the kind of CEO we need. The person who understands digital strategy, but also has that MBA kind of a background that that's a fantastic magical combination so uh, yeah in your case it will be very well worth it if that's what you want to pursue and you want to be a high level executive in a company awesome so thank you very much for taking for taking the time today and thank you again and i am now going to bring in rolanda jackson Ro all right thank you Hi, Rolanda. How are you? Hi, Dr. Matsuma. So, I'm doing fine. Thank you. How's everyone? Wonderful. Nice yeah, so please nice introduce you. yourself for one to two minutes and then let's go into your questions. Um, I, I went to school. I have my master's science degree and three certifications. I have my ITLV3 Security Plus, uh, my AWS diploma, and I have just finished my CISSP course. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. All right. So, what are your questions? What, my, what, what things are you interested in talking about today? Excuse me. Thank you. Thanks for having me, first of all. And I have four questions today. Okay. My, my first question is a person with a master's degree with three certifications looking to get into the cybersecurity industry, what would be the recommendations starting out? Well, the recommendations is a lot of it is networking because uh, many of the jobs, unfortunately, are not even advertised. And the way they have the robots doing screenings and things like that, sometimes when they see, oh, no job experience or whatever, they will immediately write off reject. Some of the hiring managers don't understand how to screen a person with a master's degree. So they're looking for that experience, thinking that somebody coming in with experience will, will be able to do the job for them. So my advice is continue networking the way you're doing it. Attend the career fairs and things like that. And I know it is challenging, but also blog write about your experiences so for example you just finished the security plus what was your experience like could you share that in a blog have you done that have you done that uh, i i haven't shared my experience in the blog no i haven't could you possibly uh, do that yes um that will be one of the things that i will start out doing right because you need to get known right people need to yes. see who is rolanda jackson and what does she know and so that is how it's, it's the same thing as building your brand. Even coming on this program like this, you did, that is a good thing. So these kinds of networking opportunities that you, you've met Katia, you've met Katoria, you've met a lot of these people. Well, guess what is, what you can see is already going on, right? You're making some connections, you're getting some interviews. That is what is going to end up finding you a job. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my, my next question is, 
I see a lot of job descriptions in a, of a minimum of 10 years experience. That's what they want. Mm -hmm. So how many years of experience in lieu of a master's degree should that be? Well, in my opinion, when somebody is doing a master's degree, that person is already ready for a leadership or executive kinds of position because a master's degree is not like a junior level person. Whoever has done a master's degree already has a pretty complex brain. They can usually communicate well, they can usually write well, and they, can, they have very complex analytical skills because that's what a strong master's degree program is designed to do. They should be able to explain things to others. They should be able to lead a team of people to achieve a particular goal or solve a problem. So I know that a lot of people ask for these things and that's why you have all heard me say many, many times, the hiring process is broken. There are places where even I have been not allowed to interview for jobs because of these stupid gateways. There is a job that I had applied for about two years ago where the gateway was that you needed to have 10 years of experience as an academic administrator. But any kind of other administrative experience did not count. Well, at that time, I had 30 years of experience in a lot of other sectors, but as an academic administrator, I only had three or four years of experience. And HR told me, no, we will not interview you. And guess what they did? They actually interviewed a full-time academic with no real world experience. So my experience was outside of academia, but that was not seen as a strength. Well, what's gonna happen? And what did happen? Person who got hired, got fired in about 15 months and was basically hopeless. So that's what's going on. A lot of this artificial barriers have been put in front of candidates, but I cannot change that. There's nothing I can do about that. I can write about it, I can rail about it, and I have been doing that. But the way to do that is to continue to hope and pray that some of the people that I've mentored and, 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 and taught leadership to that they will eventually be in those positions to hire and they will overlook all those nonsensical criteria and actually hire people who could do the job. Because to me, right now, anybody with a master's degree in cybersecurity, they probably won't have 10 years of job experience in cybersecurity. They might have 10 years of job experience in many other things. Yes. But they're still yes. excellent leaders. Yes. Leadership is leadership. It doesn't matter what field. You can apply those skills in any field. Yes, thank you. I have two more additional questions. Mm -hmm. um, is it better to just get all of your IT certifications and then allow the job to pay your, for your master's degree? Well, if you can, that is good. But what is happening is that Many companies are not really investing in their employees anymore. Some of the big companies are. Some of the companies that really understand and value their people and they want to retain the people and they want to invest the people, they are investing in, in their people and will pay for a master's degree. But sometimes some of that payment might even come with strings. So if somebody, if your company pays for the master's degree or whatever degree, they might require you to work there for say two years or three years and it might tie you to that and you may or may not want that. So a lot depends on what it is that you really want to do. For my doctoral degree, for example, well, I was actually with the city of Baltimore at that time and I could have taken the benefit from the city of Baltimore and they would have paid half of my tuition, but I didn't take it because it would have tied me to the city of Baltimore for another two years. But I didn't know what I was going to do with my career especially what, with my doctoral degree, once I did that, I would probably go into academia anyway, and I didn't want my career to be on hold. So a lot depends on the personal situation. If you're going to be with the company and they're gonna invest in you, of course that's the right way. 
And as for certifications, the same thing. I wouldn't get random certifications. They have to be for a particular purpose. What is it doing for you? Why would you do that certification? So when I did my CISSP or Security Plus or Network Plus and all that, I actually had the intention of teaching those things. And in most of those cases, you needed to have the certification in order to be able to teach. That, that's why I did it. And recently, I was almost about to let my Security Plus and Network Plus expire because I thought that they had become too expensive. And I think you were one of the people that told me, no, don't let it expire. It's not that expensive. <laughs> and I took your advice. Thank you. And, and I have one um, additional, uh, one um, last question. Uh -huh. um, what is the best website to find in order to, for a person to find or know their worth when applying for IT positions? Ah, uh, I believe salary.com is a good one. So there are many, many places where you would have to research if you're, if you're looking to negotiate a good salary or the fair salary, depending on the company. Most companies that are say nonprofits, they have to file like their executive compensations and things like that. And there is a organization, a website called, I think it is guidestar.org or something like that. It, it, that, that. That website is in my book about that. So that salary.com is a good one. And there, there must be some other websites also that does a good job of giving you ideas of what the salary ranges are going to be. But most of the time, if you're trying to negotiate a salary, my recommendation is don't ask for any number. Now, some people will insist on you giving them a number. You keep flipping it back to them that <clears throat> whoever, what, what are the people in the equivalent positions earning? And I would be more than happy to take the fair and ethical compensation that you're providing people in similar kinds of positions. Yes. Thank you so much for answering my questions and thank you for having me. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us.